Ryan Shapiro is a PhD candidate at MIT, a former research affiliate at Berkman Klein Center for Internet uh, and Society at Harvard, now the co-founder and director of the nonprofit transparency organization, uh, Property of the People. Politico has called Ryan a fo Freedom of Information Act guru. The nation has described Ryan's work as a ray of hope in these dark political times. Uh, Michigan University professor of journalism and Ted senior fellow Will Potter has called Ryan the FBI's worst nightmare. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Ryan. Green. Thank you so much for having me. Is this, this good, this volume? Hooray. All right, thank you so much for having me. It's a real genuine honor uh, for me to be here speaking with you. Um, so yeah, I'm a, some things about me. I'm a longtime animal rights and social justice activist, a transparency activist a PhD candidate at MIT, uh, where I'm an historian of the political functioning of national security and the policing of dissent. Uh, and now I'm also the co-founder and director of the nonprofit transparency organization, Property of the People. So I'm at Google, so I'm going to give a talk about search protocols. Um, this is a talk about the FBI, record systems, and democracy. But first, we're going to take just a little trip down memory lane. So I've always liked animals. Here's me as a little kid, the goat. And I got into radical politics and punk rock at a very early age. Here's me in eighth grade. And around the same time, influenced by punk rock and radical politics, I uh, became vegetarian. And then a few years later, um, I became vegan, uh, learning about how animals are treated on factory farms, confined in spaces so small they can't stand, turn around, or spread their limbs. Um, and this had a big impact on me. And so uh, I grew up in DC, and then I went to college at NYU uh, for undergrad. And while uh, in New York, I started coordinating uh, above ground uh, Direct action campaigns, civil disobedience style campaigns. Uh, this is my first arrest. I'm not the first guy, but the second guy. We're locked in these metal pipes. This is the ramp to Ringling Brothers Circus. We are preventing the uh, elephants from getting into the circus, um, shutting down the circus. They weren't able to get in, but they were able to stand above us, and the uh, Ringling folks kept them there until they urinated on us, and we marinated for hours in elephant urine, and when we were brought into jail in Southeast DC. Uh, stinking of elephant urine is quite something. Um, at NYU, I coordinated a takeover of the president's office to shut down um, a uh, laboratory where they were forcing chimpanzees to smoke crack. Um, here I am locked inside a concrete barrel to uh, protest the sale of fur. Uh, here's another shot of that. Uh, this is what it looks like getting it out. They have to use jackhammers. And, um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, when I left New York, I moved to Hawaii and uh, co-coordinated a campaign to shut down a captive dolphin facility in a shopping mall. We were making surfboard protests. Uh, uh, here I sabotaged whale hunts, riding jet skis in between the gunboats and the whales. And, and so this is all in all the mid-90s, late 90s, early 2000s. And then around 2002, along with some other activists I'd worked with for some time, I co-coordinated a year-long undercover investigation um, of foie gras producing factory farms in New York and in California. And we openly rescued a number of animals from those farms. Here's me rescuing one of the ducks from a, a foie gras factory farm in New York. We made a documentary about it. I did go to NYU undergrad uh, for film. Um, and. Uh, we got prosecuted uh, for doing this in uh, 2003 and 2004. We were facing felony burglary charges. This is Sarah Jane Blum. She and I were facing felony burglary charges in New York. Um, I was getting a master's degree in DC at the time in modern American history. Um, and to my surprise, we ended up beating the charges. Um, and so this brings us up to 2004 uh, and I had a bit of a dilemma because in 2004, there was this massive legislative and legal and prosecutorial shift um, 
2004, the FBI designated the animal rights and environmental movements the number one domestic terror threats in the United States, despite the fact that neither of these movements has ever physically injured a single person once in this country, and yet number one domestic terror threat. Not militia movements, white power movements, anti-abortion uh, folks, people who kill people, people who try to kill people, but puppy huggers and tree huggers. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, shortly after that, the passage of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, or AETA, which is a piece of pernicious post-9-11 legislation that's essentially a Patriot Act explicitly targeting animal rights and environmental protesters. Um, and there was also the prosecution of some of my closest friends and colleagues under federal felony terrorism charges for running an animal rights website, uh, they, known as the Shack 7, I, I kid you not. Um, and all of this was part of what journalist Will Potter has termed the green scare, the disproportionate use of the rhetoric and apparatus of national security to marginalize animal rights activists and environmental activists as threats to the state. Um, Will's excellent book, Green is the New Red, uh, talks about this um, if you're interested in learning more. So as I said, I had something of a dilemma. I didn't know what to do next because the model of activism that I'd, per that I'd pursued along with many other folks for the previous decade with impunity was overnight terrorism. Um, and so like lots of folks who don't know what to do next, I stayed in grad school and uh, I, I started work on a PhD uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, a program in the history of science, uh, trying to figure out how we got to this state of affairs. And then, um, and then I uh, went over to MIT, uh, where I'm now finishing up my PhD there. Um, and so you know, my dissertation, I'm interested in how we got to the state of affairs. How did the FBI come to understand the animal rights and environmental movements as the number one domestic terror threats in the country? How did the animal rights and environmental movements first come to the attention of the FBI? What was the role of industry in this process? And again, number one domestic terror threat? So uh, my um, professional uh, training as, as, as an historian is primarily archival research, at least it was at, at that time. And while some portions of my dissertation, I'm looking at a 100 year span of the use of the rhetoric and apparatus to target animal protectionists um, in the United States, some of it I was able to use archival, um, you know, standard historic, historians' archival tools. Um, but for the more modern stuff, so starting with the emergence of the modern animal rights movement in the 1970s, and certainly with FBI involvement, you know, it's not really going to be any archives um, that are going to be of use here. So I realized I would need. I was like, I'll try to use the Freedom of Information Act. I didn't know anything about FOIA at the time. Um, but I did know that it was going to be the only way uh, that I might be able to get anything. So you know, not knowing anything about FOIA, I shot off a FOIA request to the FBI. I asked for records on, on me. And FBI turned around and they said, they don't have anything. They actually said they can't find anything. But, um, uh, no records responsive to your FOIA request were located. Um, I'll be honest, I was a little hurt. You know, I, uh, I thought I was more important than that, but it's all right, you know, I could take it, it's fine. I, it's all right, it's all right. Uh, but I really wanted records and I was looking for a way in. And so, you know, Sarah Jane Blum, the, uh, the activist who I'd uh, pointed out earlier, when we were arrested for the foie gras undercover investigation and open rescue, um, Back in 03, I, we were arrested for the same thing, but we were arrested separately. Um, I was arrested just by New York State Police, but when Sarah Jane was arrested, she was arrested by uh, New York State Police and an FBI agent. So I was like, okay, well, I'm not important enough. I wasn't important enough uh, to warrant an FBI file, but Sarah Jane obviously was. I mean, there was an FBI agent there. So she kindly gave me her uh, written permission, her consent uh, to submit a request about her. That doesn't mean the FBI has to give me her files. It just means they can't use her personal privacy as an excuse to withhold them from me. And so I submitted the request on her. And um, again, results came back, same thing. I looked, couldn't find anything. I was like, well, that's, that's weird, um, but all right. And I was like, okay, I know what. I have this other friend of mine. The FBI has chased her around the country with a warrant for her DNA. They've raided her storage unit on multiple occasions. They've arrested her on multiple occasions. She's done time for grand jury resistance. The FBI is obsessed with this woman, with this, with this uh, wonderful person and actress. The FBI is obsessed with her. She definitely has a file, and like a giant file. So she kindly gave me her written consent to submit a request on her. It's like, all right, now we're going to get somewhere. 
Yeah, same thing happens. They turn around and say, now I don't have anything. It's like, oh, I get it. I'm sorry. This is my fault. This is my bad. Uh, I'm being lied to. And I was naive and didn't get it. I mean, the thing is, I've hated the FBI. Uh, Basically forever. I grew up as a punk rock kid listening to the Dead Kennedys. My first research paper ever was in eighth grade about Sacco and Vanzetti, two Italian anarchists who were ultimately murdered by uh, what would become the FBI. Um, or, well, they were executed by the state, and you know, the, the FBI was, or the Bureau of Investigation at the time, was heavily involved. Um, I read Brian Glick's War at Home about the FBI's COINTELPRO, or counterintelligence programs, where the FBI targeted the civil rights movement, uh, the black power movement, the anti war movement. I read that when it came out when I was in eighth grade. So I hated the FBI forever, but for some reason I had naively believed that the FBI uh, RIDS, the Records Inform Information Dissemination Section, that's their FOIA division at, at the FBI, I naively believed that uh, FBI RIDS, their FOIA division, would be sort of like this, not mission driven like the rest of the FBI, but this, you know, just sort of a bureaucratic outpost. And I was like, you know, when I got back the third denial letter, my friend who I know, she's got a massive file, it's like, okay, I get it, this is my fault, I'm being lied to, uh, this is my bad. And uh, no one likes being lied to, um, but I get real twitchy uh, about it. And uh, you know, we all have qualities that at some times in our lives prove more adaptive or maladaptive, depending on the circumstances. And my OCD need for conflict and contempt for federal intelligence agencies has not always been the most conducive uh, to positive outcomes. But in this case, it worked out very well. And I started to become obsessed not only with trying to get records about FBI campaigns against the animal rights and environmental movements, but trying to map out the nature of FBI noncompliance with the Freedom of Information Act. Because you know, the Freedom of Information Act is federal law, and the FBI is the leading federal law enforcement agency in the country. And this means we have the outrageous state of affairs in which the leading federal law enforcement agency in the country is in routine and flagrant violation of federal law. And the question is, how? How is the FBI systematically avoiding compliance with the Freedom of Information Act? And so that question increasingly became as and then more important to me than the original questions I was asking about FBI campaigns against the animal rights and environmental movements. And so I started submitting hundreds and hundreds of experimental requests. I got signed privacy waivers from 250 leading animal rights activists from the 1970s to the present. So just submitting hundreds of requests, trying to get records in different ways, started submitting FOIA requests about my FOIA requests. <laughs> which we'll come back to later. I scoured, you know, I was scouring FOIA case law to try and find um, anything uh, uh, that, that I could um, that would be helpful. Um, here's my uh, dog uh, and best friend, Ihi, uh, helping out with the secondary literature review. Uh, here he is again, because he's the best. Um, and so, you know, in the process, two things became apparent to me. The FBI does nearly everything in its power to avoid compliance with the Freedom of Information Act. Indeed, if FOIA work with some agencies is akin to trying to get customer service over a holiday weekend from a giant telecom, FOIA with the FBI is akin to a street fight. And number two, essential to making FOIA work with the FBI was developing an intimate familiarity with the Bureau's FOIA-specific information storage and retrieval systems. And using the techniques that I mentioned, the experimental, te experimental techniques that I mentioned, and a bunch of others, I did just that. And this really started to pay off. Um, if the FBI has X amount of first round dirty tricks that they use to avoid compliance with Freedom of Information uh, requests, Act requests, you know, I mapped out a good number of them. And I started getting a lot of documents, in fact, thousands and thousands of pages about FBI campaigns against the animal rights and environmental movements, including, oh, that's not where I thought that would be. Um, well, either way, um, so, uh, all right, so, um, we'll say hi to Ihi again, uh, yeah, and the FBI said, well, that's real cute, you're very clever, look at you, you got all these documents, um, you should be very proud of yourself, watch what we can do, and then they sat on their hands. Because the Freedom of Information Act is one of the most underappreciated elements of the entire American experiment. The notion that the records of government are the property of the people and all we need to do to get them is to ask for them is radically democratic, but FOIA is broken. And one of the main reasons FOIA is broken is that there are no penalties for noncompliance. So an agency that doesn't want to comply, or in the case of the FBI, an agency that is overtly hostile to the Freedom of Information Act, 
has no incentive to comply. And so they just sat on their hands, and an agency only has 20 working days to comply with the request, not to give me the records, but to process the request. And they sat on these requests for years. So I sued. I mean, FOIA is toothless, but it has this baby tooth. There's no penalties for noncompliance, but you can sue an agency for failure to comply. So I uh, teamed up with uh, Jeffrey Light, who is um, a brilliant FOIA specialist attorney with politics um, similar to my own. And um, you know, we, we sued the FBI uh, for failure to comply with FOIA because they took way, way, way too long um, to comply with my request, or my requests. And uh, sorry here, that's a little awkward. Um, yeah, and so what's supposed to happen in a circumstance like this is you go in and the judge is like, okay, FBI, you're obviously in violation of the law. When are you going to complain? Um, you know, not when are you going to give Ryan the documents, but when are you going to figure out what you're going to do? And instead of, you know, negotiating with me uh, via my counsel, you know, they want to do it in a year and a half. I want it yesterday. You know, maybe we'll, you know, maybe we'll agree on a calendar of nine months. The FBI comes in and invokes the nuclear option of a FOIA case called an Open America stay. They say they want seven years, actually unprecedented, to just think about how to respond to my FOIA requests. Um, Doing so, they're relying on, uh, they revived uh, a Cold War era FOIA, FOIA secrecy doctrine known as the mosaic theory of information in order to argue that my MIT dissertation FOIA research methodologies are themselves a threat to national security, which is the nicest thing that anyone's ever said about me and will look great on the cover of the book. But, um, but uh, keep in mind, the FBI is not arguing that the release of the documents that I've requested uh, with threatened national security, but rather that deciding whether or not to release the documents to me would threaten national security. And further, the purported risk to national security posed by my dissertation research is ostensibly so grave that the FBI can't even talk about it. Indeed, the FBI's primary support for its argument um, came, in the form of an, came in the form of an ex parte in-camera declaration, so a secret letter from the counterterrorism division of the FBI to the judge about why they can't tell us why my FOIA dissertation research methodologies are a threat to national security. <laughs> and this is an especially circular and Kafka-esque line of argument. The FBI considers it a national security threat to make public its reasoning for considering it a national security threat to use federal law to request information about the FBI's deeply problematic understanding of national security threats. Um, and uh, and it's important to remember that though the FBI doesn't want, you know, damning records about it coming out, uh, whether they be about, animal, you know, its campaigns against the animal rights movement, the environmental movement, or whatever, that's not what this is really about. Rather, the FBI's core motivation here is maintaining its functional immunity from the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and this brings us to FBI record systems. So one of the core ways that the FBI maintains its immunity from FOIA is through its failure by design FOIA search protocols. Since its, earlier, since its earliest days, the FBI has viewed political dissent as a threat. And since the Freedom of Information Act was first amendment, amended in 1974 to apply to the FBI and other intelligence agencies, the FBI has understood FOIA in the same light as a threat um, and has done functionally everything within their power to avoid compliance. Uh, indeed, in 2009, the National Security Archive, a great transparency organization based out of George Washington University, gave the FBI its uh, hoax uh, Rosemary Award for Worst Freedom of Information Act performance by a federal agency for outstandingly bad responsiveness to the public that flaunts the letter and spirit of the Freedom of Information Act. In like spirit, a related 2009 Associated Press article decried FBI abuses of FOIA uh, and it opened by asserting if information were a river, the FBI would be a dam. So over the years, the FBI has established countless means by which to avoid compliance with FOIA. One of the chief means by which the FBI accomplishes this is to search for records in such a way that the search routinely fails by design. The National Security Archive's 2009 study found that on average, the FBI fails to locate any records at all for every two out of three FOIA requests. That's a failure rate five times higher than other agencies on average. And you could say, well, maybe the FBI just gets a lot of crappy requests. That's not 
that's, that would be wrong. I mean, I'm sure they get a lot of crappy requests, but that is not what is happening here. So the Freedom of Information Act, the statute, it doesn't require an agency to locate records. It requires an agency to conduct a search reasonably calculated to locate responsive records. And by utilizing a deliberately um, deficient FOIA search methodology, the FBI superficially appears to be in compliance with FOIA without having to actually locate and therefore potentially release many records. So how exactly does this work? Uh, today, we're going to take a look at a key part of it. So FBI RIDS, the FOIA division at FBI, asserts that nearly all records responsive to nearly all FOIA requests will be maintained within the FBI's central records system, or CRS. And this is problematic on a number of levels. There are many FBI records that are not contained in the CRS, including the ELSA indices, the electronic surveillance uh, records, um, the FBI's indices for searching for electronic surveillance records are separate from the CRS and cannot be searched uh, uh, using a CRS search. Uh, but either way, we're not really going to deal with ELSA records right now, and we're really just going to be looking at the CRS. So um, the CRS does have a huge amount of records in it, about 115 million records, not pages, but records. It's the FBI's main investigative database. Um, and in fact, it's basically the same CRS that J. Edgar Hoover helped design in 1921. So the FBI got, uh, its inception was in 1908 when the Attorney General appointed some special agents. In 1909, it took the name Bureau of Investigation. And between 1909 and 1921, the Bureau of Investigation experimented with a whole number of records management systems. And they were all total failures. Um, in fact, it was so bad that in 1920, the FBI gave, or the Bureau of Investigation gave up entirely and just gave all of its records to the DOJ. In 1921, the DOJ said, no, thank you, and gave the records back to the, to the Bureau of Investigation, at which point J. Edgar Hoover helped design uh, what ultimately became the central record system. Notably, Hoover's first job was an entry-level position at the Library of Congress. Um, and so he uh, cared deeply about records management and brought that knowledge to bear in designing the CRS. And it's the same CRS that, uh, that we deal with um, today, both as FOIA requesters and that is the FBI's main investigative uh, database. So according to the FBI, the CRS itself cannot actually be searched. Um, it's a little unclear why this is. It's probably because the CRS is, in fact, a paper um, database of 115 million um, records. And so to search the CRS, the FBI created um, something called the ACS in 1995, which more or less mirrors the CRS and is searchable. Between 1921 and 1995, there's essentially, well, between 1921 and the early 1970s, there was no automated search capacity. Between 1970 and 79, there was a teeny bit. But, but, until, you know, but through 95, there was extremely little functional um, search capacity uh, of an automated fashion. In 95, the ECS comes in, the automated, the, uh, automated case support system. Um, and while the ACS is definitely better than nothing, it is still garbage. It is a garbage uh, search platform. Um, indeed, the inherent deficiencies of the ACS are so severe that they extend well beyond the world of FOIA. In 2005, the Department of Justice's Office of the Inspector General uh, itself concluded that there were national security. Oh, this is the document I wanted before. I apologize for that. So uh, here we go. What we have here, one of the documents that I got uh, about animal rights stuff um, showed that the FBI considered uh, pursuing uh, federal terrorism charges for p against people um, who take pictures of animals trapped in cages so small they can't stand up, turn around, or spread their limbs. And uh, the LA Times wrote about it, and I was just certainly distressed to see my own name. Uh, the people that they're considering pursuing federal terrorism charges for taking pictures of animals trapped in cages. But back to the DOJ OIG's 2005 um, report, which said 
that there are national security implications because the FBI is continuing to rely on the ACS, which hampers FBI agents and analysts from adequately searching and sharing information from their investigative files. The 2005 DOJ OIG report further found that the need for a new automated, automated investigative case management system to replace the existing obsolete and limited ACS system is vital to the FBI's ability to perform its mission effectively. And the 2005 DOJ OIG report also further found the critical need to replace the ACS, the FBI's obsolete case management system, remains. And starkly, the very first recommendation in the conclusion of this 2005 DOJ OIG report was replace the obsolete ACS system as quickly and cost effectively as feasible. Yet, the FBI continues to rely upon this antiquated, obsolete, and limited ACS system for FOIA search purposes, even while the FBI has increasingly relied upon more modern non-ACS search platforms for its non-FOIA operations. Indeed, even the FBI's own 2004 report to the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, the FBI's counterterrorism program since September 2001, found that the FBI's grievous failure to identify or prevent the terrorist attacks of the September 11, 2001 was in part due to the woefully deficient nature of the ACS. Found the FBI's 2004 report on September 11, 2001, the Bureau's information technology was inadequate to support its counterterrorism mission. A core element of this deficiency was that the FBI had a deficient information management system. The FBI's legacy investigative information system, the Automated Case Support, or ACS, was not very effective in identifying information or supporting investigations. So the ACS is so bad, it's partially to blame, according to the FBI, for 9-11. And yet, this is still what the FBI is using for FOIA search purposes. Additionally, the FBI's own actions further demonstrate that the Bureau itself believes reliance on ACS searches is woefully insufficient. The FBI has lobbied for and received hundreds of millions of dollars to develop next generation record search capabilities in no small, in no small part because of the FBI and DOJ's own assertions pertaining to the dangerous poverty of reliance upon ACS searches. For example, the FBI's Sentinel database and investigative data warehouse, or IDW, which has been referred to as a, quote, Uber Google, are examples of some of these, at times, wildly expensive, quote, next generation FBI search platforms that offer modern full text search capabilities. Yet the Bureau nearly always refuses to utilize these capabilities for FOIA purposes. Instead, for FOIA searches, the FBI insists upon using the ACS. So, Let's talk about the ACS. The ACS is comprised of three primary search applications that the FBI can use to perform what am to what amounts to searches of the CRS. One of these is the Universal uh, Index, or UNI. Um, then there is the ICM, or Investigative Case Management uh, Search Platform, Search Application. And then there is the ECF, or Electronic Case File. Now, the FBI's default FOIA search protocols involved utilization of the UNI to search an arbitrarily produced index or indices of FBI CRS records mirrored within the ACS. The FBI has long publicly insisted that a UNI index search alone is adequate for FOIA purposes, and therefore the FBI nearly always refuses to utilize either of ACS's other two search applications, the ICM or the ECF. Um, internally, however, uh, well, you know, the, uh, uh, here's a training slide for when to do an ECF search. Um, basically, in very rare cases, or if it's a high visibility case, so people might notice that the FBI is conducting a deficient search. Um, so, yeah, we should talk about the ECF. So the ACS of, ACS's ECF application conducts full text searches of the CRS. Um, it's not a great full text search. It's a 1995 full text search, but it's a full text search. Um, uh, and as opposed to the UNI, um, which only searches several limited lists 
of arbitrarily indexed subjects of the CRS. The ECF performs a relatively modern full text search of the CRS. So on the one hand, the UNI is just a list of indexes. It's just indices. Uh, the ECF, it conducts a full text search of everything in the ECS, which is most of the things that are in the CRS, which is what we want to do. We really want more than the CRS, but we, we don't get to deal with that. Uh, right now, we're just trying to do the CRS. We're trying to search the CRS. Um, so again, the ECF uh, full text searches, it's not a modern Sentinel or IDW, the Uber Google um, uh, full text search, but it's still a full text search. However, declares the FBI's FOIA chief, David Hardy, only under extraordinary circumstance. Oh, sorry, here's a screen capture uh, of, um, of an ECF search. So this is what we want them to do, right? Like, that's the sort of how low the bar is here, right? Um, this is like, oh, please do this. Um, but uh, yeah, so. David Hardy, the head of uh, the FBI's FOIA division, says that, quote, only under extraordinary circumstances would the FBI conduct ECF full text searches of the CRS in response to a FOIA request. Somewhat amazingly, the FBI insists that ECF full text searches are not more likely to locate responsive records than you and I uh, index searches. Um, further, the FBI argues that ECF full text searches for FOIA requests are unduly burdensome and would be wasteful of FBI resources. Declared FBI FOIA chief David Hardy in 2014. Full text searches such as the ECF are considered an extraordinary measure uh, that is unduly burdensome and not reasonably likely to locate responsive records. And the net result of a full text search is typically a significant use of time and resources that yield no additional responsive information. As such, the ACS index search of the CRS is the key to locating information responsive to FOIA requests. Um, so again, searching this arbitrarily produced index rather than a full text search is the key. And these are, these are submitted under penalty of perjury. Um, the FBI's position here is akin to suggesting that a search of a limited and arbitrarily produced card catalog at a vast library, 115 million volume library, is as likely to locate book pages containing a specified search term as a full text search of a database containing digitized versions of most books in the library. I mean, it, simply the FBI's assertion is absurd on its face. Notably, and as one can see, in this document, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, this document from 2007, for its own investigative non-FOIA purposes, the FBI routinely uses the ACS, uh, ECF application to conduct full text searches of the CRS, and they don't think it's that much of a burden. So here, uh, the FBI is a uh, you know, counterterrorism division. They're very stressed that animal rights activists are having their annual conference at you know, a convention center hotel in DC. Um, I was there. It was all right. Um, and you know, the FBI notes, again, in this counterterrorism document, and note the date on it. Not that long before 2000, and the FBI is spending its time looking at puppy hoggers, meeting at a conference in DC. At this time, there's no specific intelligence to suggest that any participants in this upcoming conference are planning to engage in criminal activity, but these paid lobby groups of the biomedical research industry say that some activists last a couple years ago got arrested protesting outside of McDonald's when they had a convention, you know, when they had a, a conference there over the summer. Um, and so this whole document, this whole counterterrorism document is big intelligence score. We got a list of the speakers. Yeah, it was publicly posted, We're trying to get people to come to a conference. And down here, no, a prompt and limited checking of initial leads has been performed by, um, uh, it doesn't matter, regarding um, blah, 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 a review of the ACS support uh, utilizing free text searches revealed the following, which may be of interest to recipients. So. Prompt and limited review of the ACS full text search. So when the FBI is asked to use uh, ECF full text searches for FOIA purposes, it is unduly burdensome and doesn't work. It's redundant and unduly burdensome. But when they need to do it for their own purposes because they want to see 
literally who the listed speakers coming to town are. Um, it's prompt, it's limited, it's easy, they do it. That's what they do because it's the only thing that makes sense. Um, so for FOIA purposes, the FBI nearly always refuses to use any of the full text searches available to it, whether it be the ACS's antiquated but functional ECF or the Bureau's uh, you know, modern Sentinel and IDW platforms. Instead, as noted, the FBI's default FOIA search protocol involves utilization of the UNI to search an index or indices of FBI CRS records mirrored within the ACS. And this is a uh, screen capture of a UNI, so an index search. Um, the one we saw before was the good one. This is the bad one. Um, yeah, um, so, right. So the FBI relies upon index searches, uh, indices-based searches to, um, to conduct FOIA uh, searches. Um, and this is a serious problem. First, in order for the names or other search terms um, to be entered into an index, they have to be indexed. And these are not automated indexing processes. It's literally a case agent or frequently his or her secretary going through with a pencil after they've completed creating a document and saying this name, this person, you had a 20 page report, you wanna go home. You're underlining names, you pass it off to your secretary, he or she wants to go home, right? And that's also inconsistent, so it's very limited. It's, it's not like every word, it's the teeny minority of words that gets indexed, it's arbitrarily produced. Um, different people are going to index differently and it's extremely limited. Um, uh, yeah, notably this UNI search, no records were found um, as is the case most of the time, two out of three times. Um, even David Hardy, head of FBI uh, FOIA uh, himself, concedes in court declarations that the indexing of records by the FBI, which are essential to FBI uni searches, is characterized by a largely discretionary and even arbitrary set of practices not designed or suited uh, for the purpose of effectively locating records responsive to FOIA requests. So for example, this is an FBI record about spying on um, the uh, anti-apartheid movement in the United States, uh, believing that the anti-apartheid movement and Nelson Mandela are a Kremlin-directed plot to undermine American uh, national security. And this is what indexing looks like. The agent, underline a name, or a group, or a phrase, or whatever. And then the secretary, once he or she is done entering manually the selected uh, search uh, terms into the index, We'll cross it out, say, hey, I did it, right? So here's the same document indexed by a different office. Notably, the ANC, Mandela's uh, political party, the anti-apartheid uh, resistance party, South Africa, it's indexed here. So conceivably, and we'll get to uh, why it probably wouldn't, but conceivably an index-based search would come up with a hit here uh, if you were searching for records on the ANC, but not here, uh, because indexing is not only limited, but arbitrary. Further in the same document, the exact same thing, but reversed. Now the other document has the index item, and this one doesn't. South African president uh, de Klerk, no index. South African president de Klerk, index. Again, not only is FBI indexing a tremendously limited uh, practice, but it is also, uh, especially for FOIA search purposes, it works well for the FBI's purpose of, you know, they want to be able to retrieve the information for their investigative purposes. Um, but from a FOIA perspective, I mean, it, it's again, limited and arbitrary. Um, so because there are uh, these inherent problems with FBI records uh, indexing procedures, UNI searches frequently fail to locate a large percentage of responsive records. Simply, the overwhelming majority of percentile search terms just aren't indexed. So searches of the uni indices for these terms produce no responsive results. I mean, nothing is indexed on this page. So if you want something on this page, submit a FOIA request for it. Nope. Here you have these things. That's all that's indexed. Um, but even within UNI searches, not all UNI searches 
are created equally crappy. Um, some uni searches are far more inadequate than others. So UNI searches can be performed in two primary ways. One is to uh, perform a UNI index search of its main file index, and the other is to conduct a search of the UNI's cross-reference index. So um, the FBI asserts that a main file, uh, something that would show up in the main file index, is a main entry, a main file, carries the name of someone who is the subject of a file. Right? If the FBI is really interested in you, if you're being targeted by the FBI, if you're relevant, you're a main file. What's a cross-reference according to the FBI? A cross-reference is defined as a mere mention of or passing reference to the subject of the request and files relating to other individuals, organization, events, or activities. So let's say the FBI is investigating you. You'd be a main file according to, according to this. The person you spoke to at the ice cream store before you went to rob the bank, allegedly, um, you know, that person might be a cross-reference, right? That's, you know, they're trivial, insignificant. You really, it's just really not important. Um, further, starts the FBI. Our experience has shown that even when cross-reference records are actually responsive to a FOIA request, references usually contain information similar to the information already processed in a main file. So it's going to be redundant. Uh, it's insignificant. And it was significant, it's redundant. You would have gotten it anyway. Um, so with this as justification, this uh, main file versus cross-reference uh, distinction, the FBI's policy, their FOIA, their FOIA policy, is not only to limit FOIA searches of the CRS to the ACS's uni application, but to limit those uni searches solely to the uni application's main file index. If one, there, there's an exception to this uh, policy. So if you submit a request to the FBI and they conduct a main file only uh, search and you are sophisticated enough and have the time to submit an appeal of that request to the Department of Justice's Office of Information Policy appealing the inadequate search uh, because the FBI only conducted a main file request and they should be conducting a cross-reference request too and you know this, then OIP, the Department of Justice Office of Information Policy, maybe nine months later, there's a good chance that they will ultimately remand your request back to the FBI. Maybe it took them a year, two years to get it to you in the first place, the denial letter, the main file denial letter, you appeal nine months later, OIP remands, a year or two later, maybe then the FBI does a cross-reference search for you. But if you appeal inadequate search based on the uh, lack of a cross-reference search, the FBI as a policy, they are potentially open to conducting a uh, cross-reference search, and also if you sue. The FBI will automatically conduct a cross-reference search because the FBI does not want this issue uh, to be before a court as case law because it's so grossly violative of FOIA. The Freedom of Information Act requires an agency to conduct searches reasonably calculated to locate responsive records. This, does, this is not reasonably calculated to locate responsive records. So if you sue automatically, the FBI wants to moot the issue and they will do a cross-reference search for you. Um, so, but for the vast majority of FOIA requesters um, who neither appeal nor litigate, they just get a no responsive records uh, denial letter. We searched main files and, and didn't get anything. So the FBI tells us that essentially everything a FOIA requester might reasonably want is likely to come up under a UNI main file search of the ACS, and that a UNI cross-reference search would be, again, wasteful and redundant, which the FBI often continues, because they're the FBI, therefore constitutes a threat to national security, because wasting the FBI's time, thank you, bin Laden, right? And um, so let's take a closer look at how this actually plays out in practice. We've seen what the FBI has to say. Maybe just because I'm cynical, let's take a closer look and uh, about how it operates in reality. So again, the FBI makes clear at the initial administrative stage, so that means when you submit a FOIA request. It is the FBI's policy to search for and identify only main file records responsive to FOIA requests. Um, and here, surprisingly, that search resulted in no record being located. And again, here, yeah, searches are conducted for main files. This is a training slide. Uh, 
you know, searches are conducted for main files. Searches may also locate reference files. If you provide information that's almost impossible to actually meet their standards on, um, or if you appeal, right? And again, but that's years later. Um, so let's look at some examples of how this plays out in real life. I submitted a Freedom of Information Act request for records on the Profer Lobby Group, uh, the Anti Animal Rights Lobby Group, FC USA, or the Fur Commission USA. 2011. The FBI gives me a denial letter, unable to identify main file records responsive to the FOIA. It's the same language that everyone, that most people get when they submit a FOIA request and they get a denial. Uh, people read it to think that the FBI is saying they don't have anything. What it says is we looked and we couldn't find anything. What it actually says is we looked in one database using one search methodology for you know, a very limited set of file types, and oh yeah, we didn't find anything. And by the way, that's the point. But um, Either way, so submit my FOIA request, FC USA, unable to identify main file uh, uh, record responsive to the FOIA. Then, with a cross reference search, which I, as I do appeal to everything and I do litigate, you know, here is a document. And so, again, the FBI claims that a cross reference, and this, is, this comes up in a cross reference search. Uh, a search of the uh, UNI's cross-reference uh, indices for records on FCUSA. So again, the, F the FBI said that cross-references are mere trivial passing reference. Here, the FBI is having a meeting with the FCUSA, introducing an intelligence analyst at the FBI to a representative from the FCUSA, this fur, this fur industry lobby group, um, to be a routine point of contact with the San Diego division of the FBI. Um, here the police are meeting with the FCUSA, the meeting which is hosted by FCUSA and held at this resort. FCUSA is holding trainings for the FBI on how to deal with puppy huggers. Um, you know, and, uh, and the FBI is giving information to FCUSA. They have a routine back and forth. Um, FCUSA is teaching the FBI how to use the FCUSA's database of animal rights activists uh, because the FCUSA isn't um, they don't have any of the limitations that the FBI ostensibly has on spying on protected First Amendment activities. Um, review and discussion of how law enforcement and the FCUSA can best complement each other. So hardly a trivial or passing reference, certainly not duplicative. No responsive records came up under the main file and far from trivial. All right, now next. Submitted a FOIA request of my dear friend, the legendary Steve Sittman. Steve Sittman in 1977 was one of two men, the other is Kenneth Lavasser, who participated in the first reported animal liberation in US history, the liberation of two dolphins, which were at a University of Hawaii and Navy laboratory in downtown Honolulu. Uh, they called themselves the Undersea Railroad. Um, submitted this request on Steve Sittman, unable to identify responsive main file records. I also submitted a request on Kenny, on Kenneth Lavasser's records, because I got signatures from both of them. Kenny's came back. Now, so it turns out, for something to come up as responsive as a hit on the main file index, not only does it truly need to be a subject, but it literally needs to be the top line of the subject. And just like indexing, the top line is arbitrary. It's up to the case agent. It could be alphabetical. It could be perceived importance. It could be who has a better beard, right? Like, it's totally arbitrary. And it can change over the course of an investigation. They can move it around. And literally, a request for Sitman, no main files. A request for Lavasser, main file, because he's the top. You can see that Sitman's indexed. You can see the line. But he's a cross-reference because he's not the top, top line. And let's say the top line had been undersea railroad. Then neither, which it easily could be, then neither of them would have come up as a main file. Let's say it had been theft of two dolphins from the Koala Basin Marine Mammal Laboratory as the top line. Then not even Undersea Railroad would have come up. And not only does it have to be in the subject and the top line, it has to be all that the top line is. So this comes up as a cross-reference for Nelson Mandela. So a main file search on Nelson Mandela 
would not come up with a, with a hit for visit of Nelson Mandela to the United States. This is a cross-reference, because it's not Nelson Mandela on the top line. It's visit of Nelson Mandela to the United States. Similarly, also a cross-reference release. Visit of Nelson Mandela to accept his Freedom Award in Memphis, Tennessee. Not a main file search. So you submit a request to the FBI, and they conduct only an index-based search and only a main file index-based search. And you ask for Nelson Mandela, you don't get this. You don't get it. Um, and the records that I got on Mandela showed that the FBI in 1990, after Mandela got out of prison, after, after 27 years in prison in South Africa for his anti-apartheid activities, the FBI was tasked with protecting Mandela when he came to the United States to continue his anti-apartheid efforts. The FBI was tasked with protecting Mandela. And while they were doing that, they took the opportunity to place a confidential informant within Mandela's inner circle in the United States to pass political information to the FBI about Mandela's uh, and his anti-apartheid associates activities in the United States. And then let's look at this one. TSBR, the Texas Society for Biomedical Research, another lobby group for the biomedical industry. Unable to identify main file records. OK, what do we got? I appealed. Let's look at the dates. So I submitted the request maybe a year before that. They come back, tell me they don't have anything, and they're able to identify main files. Now in 2012, after I appealed, DOJ OIP says, all right, all right, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll remand it to the, to, to the FBI to look for, for cross-references. OK. Lo and behold, they find some. I get them a couple, you know, I get them in February of this year. Six pages, you know, and the first of the documents, you know, it's, it's more than a passing fleeting reference. The FBI is getting uh, an alert from the Texas Society uh, for Biomedical Research. Uh, TSPR has been monitoring animal rights hotlines. And it's rumored that the widely broadcast protests that happened, uh, that happened every year uh, are going to happen. Um, and uh, but OK, so uh, you know, didn't, we didn't get that. Um, and then we also got this one. I mean, the FBI attends another workshop held by a biomedical, but you know, by a uh, anti-animal rights lobby group, um, uh, you know, to talk about animal enterprise terrorism uh, laws. Uh, and again, it come up as as trivial. Uh, the fact that the FBI is actively colluding, getting so much of their information about targeting the animal rights environmental movements, which the FBI declares the number one domestic terror threat in the United States, uh, getting the, this information directly from the corporate interests um, who are opposing the animal rights movement, um, yeah, it is anything but trivial. And again, literally the line is actually the entire top line, but because there's a little bit after that, we don't get it. But OK, OK. So. I sued and got processing notes from this FOIA request. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. So this is from the second passage. This is after the remand, right? Uh, so I just got the documents. It was remanded in 12. And they searched again. They did a cross-reference search. They located the six pages, those two files, 2012, OK, because they did a cross-reference search. And here is the search slip. And these are going to become important in a minute. This is the search slip for the second request when they did a cross-reference search. You can see, even though no responsive records came up when they just did a main file search, here we go. Cross-reference search brings up the two things, including the FBI going to the meeting held by TSBR. Um, I also got the FOIA search slip for the first request. And they came up. They, they found them then, but they still gave me no responsive main file uh, denial letter. So it's not just, I mean, so they actually conducted the main file and cross reference search here, but they simply chose not to give them to me because the policy is not to give out. It's not just that they're not conducting them, they're not giving them out even if they find them. Literally, they found them. And that first document, they gave me a no responsive main file records were found. It's true because of how they define main file records, but they literally even found them and didn't give them to me. Right. So 
there is also one additional possibility here as to why the FBI didn't give me these records. Um, and that's that they're control files and the FBI blackballs control files. Control files just mean it's sort of a meta file and the FBI doesn't give out those records for no good reason. They just say they are blackballed and then Jason Leopold, a great journalist who I work with sometime, did an expose or did an article on blackballing. Then the FBI continued doing it but just changed the name to analyst removed. Um, but either way, so let's talk about search slips uh, for a moment. Um, how much time do I have? Or Cool, yeah, because I'm going to talk about that now. So that's perfect. Okay, sure. What's the question? I tend to be a bit loquacious, so I can go over. Sorry about that. So um, just to illustrate how far the FBI will go to conceal the deliberate and unlawful inadequacy of their FOIA searches, their default FOIA searches, we're going to look at an ongoing FOIA lawsuit of mine uh, which is a lawsuit for FOIA search slips. So sometime in 2010, prior to that, prior to 2010, you request a FOIA search slip, the FBI, more often than not, would release it to you. Sometime in, in late 2010, the FBI stopped. They didn't give any explanation. They say, hey, no response to main file records. You looked and didn't find anything. What do you mean you looked and didn't find anything? You, you have it. You generate it with every FOIA request. Nope. Uh, I don't know what you mean. You know. Um, by uh, early 2012, the FBI and DOJ jointly came up with an explanation or a justification. Um, I mean, the bottom line is the FBI just don't want people seeing um, how bad their searches are. But um, in 2012, the FBI and DOJ jointly came up with a formal policy and supposed justification um, for it. Um, and the, FBI, the policy they said, the FBI is not going to give out any search slips for investigative records that are uh, less than 25 years old. And it's justified on the basis of FOIA exemption 7E. FOIA has nine exemptions. So legitimate reasons that an agency is permitted to withhold records. So you see things redacted, B5. That's exemption B5. Um, B5 is the withhold it because you want to uh, uh, exemption, as it's commonly known. But um, uh, deliberative process. Uh, B6 is personal privacy, so it'll be someone's name. There are nine FOIA exemptions, and there are subdivisions of them, B7A, B7D. Um, by the way, there's nine FOIA exemptions uh, with subdivisions. And the FBI says, we're not going to give out any search slips, uh, just categorically not going to give out search slips because 7E. That's notable because 7E is the FOIA exemption that prevents disclosure of information that would reveal law enforcement techniques not generally known to the public. So secret law enforcement techniques. The FBI claims that giving out this would give the public information on secret law enforcement techniques, how they search for FOIA uh, records. Um, so in, late, in 2012, along with some other requesters, uh, I sued uh, challenging this policy uh, itself. Um, and then in February of 2014, the FBI gives its first official explanation of, why is that a 7E? What are you talking about? And it, um, how are they protecting a, a secret law enforcement technique um, by not giving out FOIA search slips? And the answer that the FBI gave in court has to do with FOIA exclusions. So FOIA has nine exemptions, which an agency, as I said, can use to legitimately withhold. They can also abuse those exemptions, but they can legitimately withhold records. Um, under those exemptions. Uh, the, the records are subject to FOIA. It's just those individual records. They would violate someone's personal privacy. I mean, I can't request your FBI file, even though you are allegedly accused of robbing this bank, because you haven't given me your personal consent, B6, B7C, personal privacy. That's reasonable. Um, FOIA exclusions, uh, we can thank the Reagan administration for the Reagan administration and Attorney General Ed Meese under Reagan. They were real stressed that in 1974, when FOIA is amended to target the intel or to apply to the uh, FBI and other law enforcement, intelligence agencies, the military, that this was really damaging to national security. And so in 86, uh, Attorney General Ed Meese pushed through uh, under the guise of fighting the war on drugs. All these revisions to FOIA, which really uh, eroded a lot of it. And one of the major parts of what the 86 FOIA amendments did was to include exclusions, which are just, hey, the agency doesn't want to tell you that these records exist. Um, and so they're going to, you know, they're going to lie to you about it. Uh, they're going to say, 
You just, you know, you search, you request records, they find records, and they're going to say, because it's such a national security problem for us to admit that the records exist, not, we can't even say we can either confirm or deny. We're just going to deny. And that's an exclusion. The records are actually excluded from FOIA. They're not subject to FOIA. And the FBI said that they can't give out FOIA search slips because maybe we'll be able to figure out that an exclusion was used somewhere. Keep in mind that last, in the 2016, the FBI uh, used exclusions 93 times. They have to report um, how many exclusions they use a year. That's out of roughly 14,000 requests that the FBI processed. But the FBI says a savvy requester might be able to figure out if an exemption is being used. It's unclear how, because uh, I don't think it's going to be like stamped exemption, uh, exclusion. Um, so it's, it's, it's unclear how. I mean, as we can see, there's lots of reasons that the FBI might not give out a, uh, documents, even if they found them. But either way, the FBI, um, so the FBI claims that disclosure of search slips might help a requester deduce the use of an exclusion and argues that the FBI, uh, you know, that exclusions are law enforcement techniques not generally known to the public. And so the FBI is arguing here that it can't release FOIA search slips under 25 years old because the FBI claims that lying to FOIA requesters is a law enforcement technique not generally known to the public. And like, no, for real, use of FOIA exclusions as a law enforcement subterfuge. Um, according to the FBI, the use of subterfuge, ruse, or cover is a fundamental law enforcement tool, technique, or procedure whereby an investigative agency employs a form of cloak to cover the true nature and scope of investigative efforts to detect criminal activity and safeguard national security. Functionally, there is no discernible difference between using intentional misinformation from an undercover agent or informant and the authorized use of exclusions in response to a FOIA request for investigative records. No discernible difference. Um, in both instances, the subterfuge or mis of mis misinformation functions as a protective mechanism to protect the integrity of sensitive FBI criminal and national security investigations. So for, for real, the FBI is saying that lying to FOIA requesters is a secret law enforcement technique not generally known to the public, and that's why you can't see FOIA search slips. The judge in uh, January of 2016 said, no, no, FBI, that's, that's not right. Um, exclusions are not law enforcement techniques, they're, they're law. They're, they're part of the statute. They're, they're not a law enforcement technique, they're, they're literally the law, so you, you can't do that. You can't categorically withhold FOIA search slips on uh, the basis of 7E. Um, you know, you gotta, gotta give me the, the, the search slips. Uh, but then um, the FBI turns around and says, hey judge, you know what? You know that policy you just rolled on um, and said we can't use it anymore? Um, yeah, well, we don't actually have that policy anymore. And in fact, like, we haven't for like a year. We got rid of it like a year ago. We just didn't bother to tell you or anyone. We just let everyone fight about it for a year. Uh, didn't bother to tell you that we got rid of it and we have a new policy. And, um, you know, because we have a new policy, which is basically just the same policy, just tweaked a little bit, um, we should get to fight about that now. Uh, we should get to have a whole new round of briefing uh, on, on that. And, um, because it's new, and so we should get to fight about that, basically start the trial over. Um, you know, because as I said, we got rid of that policy like a year ago, so like it really doesn't matter, judge. And not only that, the FBI is like, and yeah, I'm totally doing this verbatim. Um, uh, also, judge, by the way, not only should we get to like fight about our new policy now, but we should also get to introduce new exemptions now, too. I know we said 7E before, uh, and I know that like, we have to introduce all our exemptions like up front at once, otherwise the case will literally go on forever. Uh, and we only did 7E, but we want a whole bunch of new ones now to uh, continue to the FBI. And I'm quoting here, yeah, you know, I know we were supposed to, but like we didn't, so we should get to do it now. Um, we weren't acting in bad faith. We just basically didn't think we'd lose, and so we didn't bother to do it. Um, so now we want a do-over. Um, and in this do-over, we're not only going to rely on our new policy, which is the same policy, just tweaked a little, uh, but we're also beyond just 7E, which is we're using in the new policy, just tweaked. We're also going to bring in exemptions 1, 3, 5, 6, 7A, 7C, 7D, and 7F. Um, this case actually warrants its own talk. It just goes on uh, forever. But the judge, while pissed at the FBI for obvious reasons, 
essentially gave the FBI almost everything they wanted because at the end of the day, even judges who are skeptical um, end up balking uh, too much of the time when the FBI turns around and says, really, judge? Really, you know national security better than the FBI? Oh, where'd you go to national security school? Because we're the FBI, and you know, I know it doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but do you want the next Twin Towers falling on your hands? Because that's what it's gonna be, and we're gonna make sure everyone knows it when you cause it to happen. So you wanna release records on puppy huggers? You wanna release FOIA search slips? So you think you know national security better than the FBI? We're gonna make sure everyone knows it when people die on your watch. And the judges, far more often than than is acceptable, um, in a democracy, they, um, you know, they, they, they cave and defer uh, to the agency. Um, uh, and so when the FBI screams national security, even for FOIA search slips, and that's what exemptions one and three are about here, um, judges cave, and this case is ongoing, and we're still fighting it. Um, but again, remember, all of this happening in this case is occurring primarily just so that the FBI can prevent FOIA requesters from seeing how deliberately shitty FBI FOIA searches actually are. So, as I said, FOIA is one of the most underappreciated elements of the entire American experiment. The notion that the records of government are the property of the people and all we need to do to get them is to ask for them is radically democratic, but FOIA is broken. And this is just one part of the ongoing crisis of secrecy we now face. Harvard historian of science, Peter Gallison, uh, has uh, shown that the universe of classified knowledge, classified knowledge, published classified knowledge, now exponentially exceeds the universe of published unclassified knowledge. And this disparity grows worse by the day, literally, the universe of published non-classified knowledge is dwarfed exponentially by classified knowledge. The vast majority of published information in the world is inaccessible um, without security clearances. And classification is just one part of the problem. Most of the records I'm seeking from the FBI here aren't classified. The government just won't give them up. In fact, the FBI and DOJ invoke classification only about 5% of the times when it denies FOIA requests. 95% of FOIA denials are not pertaining to classified. They just deny them for whatever reasons. 7E is not classified. It's law enforcement techniques not generally known to the public. <sighs> Secrecy is a cancer on the body of democracy. And you know, increasingly, my focus has been uh, on transparency activism. And uh, along with Jeffrey Light, uh, my amazing attorney, um, we've been scaling up our efforts. And uh, around the time of the election, uh, we incorporated as a nonprofit, uh, 501c3 transparency organization. Uh, we've been joined by the amazing Sir Jane Blum, the uh, woman uh, who uh, was on the cover of the, the documentary and who also, they said, she did not have an FBI file, which she does. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, started with a successful crowdfunding campaign. We're currently in our startup phase, and now we are building capacity. I'm uh, proud to announce that we just hired our first employee, our new attorney. Uh, the brilliant Gunita Singh. Um, and some highlights of our successes so far include, oh, I meant to have that up. All right, yep, Property of the People. This is the name of our organization coming from our, our motto, the records of government are the property of the people. Check us out on Twitter. Here's our web page. Some of our successes include, some of, you know, some of these are before we incorporated, but it's still the same team. Exposing the, early, the now earliest known utiliz FBI utilization of classified remote installation to circumvent encryption happened to be against animal rights activists who are friends of mine, 2003. We also exposed that the DOJ unlawfully failed to report details of that uh, to, to Congress as they are required uh, to do. And we've got a new project looking into um, broader issues associated there. Uh, we exposed that the FBI spied on Nelson Mandela and viewed him not only as a communist threat, but placed a uh, confidential informant in his inner circle when they were supposed to be protecting him. We exposed that uh, the American Egg Board, a USDA entity, uh, was unlawfully colluding with um, the egg industry to uh, um, prevent uh, Hampton Creek, a manufacturer of uh, eggless uh, mayonnaise, um, from being able to succeed as a corporation. Um, the president of uh, the American Egg Board was forced to resign in disgrace as a result. Um, uh, we exposed uh, FBI uh, policy of uh, warning its technical agents not to share details of its technical surveillance with um, both prosecutors and defendants alike. And most recently, and this is after incorporation as property of the people, um, I mean, now we focus a, a, a huge amount of our uh, resources, which are limited, but nonetheless, on the Trump administration. Um, and uh, so recently we exposed 
Here's a document that we got, which shows a National Security Council payment to Trump's Mar-a-Lago uh, luxury resort, um, which is likely a violation of the uh, Constitution's domestic emoluments clause. Uh, literally a constitutional violation. Um, and uh, yeah, so democracy cannot meaningfully function without an informed citizenry, and such a citizenry is impossible without broad public access to records about the operations of government. This has always been the case, and given President Trump and his administration's overt contempt for transparency and a free pr press, it has never been more so. And of course, Google itself is in the business of providing information to the people to create good. And when the majority of published information in the world is kept hidden from public view, when false news dominates and the actual actions of government are kept secret, this is a problem not only for, de for democracy, but for Google as well. It's not surprising those in power wish to keep their actions secret. What's surprising is how readily we tolerate it. I'll say it again. The records of government are the property of the people, and it's time we reclaim them. Thank you. Uh, when you file a uh, FOIA request, there's a section in which uh, it asks you something along the lines of how hard do you want us to try, i.e., how much money are you willing to spend on us going above and beyond a normal lookup? What's that actually for? If I said I'm willing to spend $1,000, what happens? Sure, uh, that's a great question. So they're not really asking how hard you want them to try. Uh, just as the agencies, and especially the FBI, uh, used efficient FOIA search protocols um, as a barrier to preventing um, people from uh, conducting successful FOIA requests, uh, agencies, certainly very much including the FBI, use FOIA fees as a way to do the same. So they're not actually saying they're going to work harder. The FBI is interested in preventing people from submitting successful FOIA requests. And so when they're saying, how much are you willing to pay, they're trying to figure out if they can make you go away. Can they make you go away because they're taking too long? Can they make you go away because they're not locating the records? Can they make you go away because they're saying, we're going to charge you a lot of money for it? And there's all sorts of fees that the agencies can charge. They can charge for search, um, review, or duplication fees. And fees, I mean, since FOIA was amended in 74, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about um, how, agency use, how agency use fees as, um, as speed bumps uh, on, I'm trying to remember the metaphor they use, something like speed bumps on the highway for information. Either way, um, so what's going on there is the agency is trying to scare you off. What I would encourage you to do, and I, I don't know um, this individual situation, but requesters, um, FOIA requesters can ask for a, um, a fee waiver, uh, and they can also ask for placement in a, um, a particular fee category. So if someone's a student, someone should request placement in the educational. Uh, what one should do if they're looking for these um, ways to get out of paying fees, legitimate ways to get out of paying fees. I request a waiver of fees, and I also request placement in X, Y, or Z fee category. So educational fee category. Um, uh, or representative of the news media fa fee category. Um, this way, agencies, if you get either of those, the agencies can't charge search fees. And search fees can be $45 an hour. And the agency can charge as much. They can say, it's going to take us 1,000 hours to search for stuff that you're requesting. We don't know if we're going to find anything. But you're going to owe us the money no matter what. And you've got to pay half of it up front. And uh, search requires this level of analyst, and so that's $45 an hour. So you owe us a whole lot of money. You sure you want to go forward with this? Um, and so if you can get um, either educational requester status, fee requester, uh, like fee status, um, or, uh, or a representative of the news media, uh, agencies are no longer allowed to assess um, search fees or review fees, and then you're stuck with only with duplication fees, um, you know, which you know, aren't really going to go about, above about like 10 cents a page, which while it can still ultimately be onerous, it's not $45 an hour, unlimited and independent of any, whether or not you get records. Thank cool. you, Thank Ryan. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. I really enjoy it. Thanks. <laughs>